Good morning. Good morning. I figured you'd been uh, helped to warmly welcome speakers, right? <laughs> so good to be with you today about the most important thing in our lives, which, which is Jesus yes. and the news about Jesus. And today I want to ask, here's my title, hang on with me through it. Why doesn't the good news, the gospel, feel like news? And why doesn't it feel sometimes to us good? It's not always the case in our lives, at least not in my life. I, unlike maybe many of you here, came from an unchurched background. My parents were Unitarians growing up and pretty anti-religious fanaticism, as they called it. And so I didn't have any spiritual core in my upbringing. And I'll never forget when my ninth grade friend invited me to a beach, a week at the beach in Ocean City, New Jersey. Yeah, somebody from New Jersey, okay. So, and uh, I remember, uh, he didn't even tell me what it was about. He just said, oh, we're going to the beach. And I thought, I'll catch some rays, hang out, swim in the ocean, uh, you know, maybe connect with a girl, although at that time, I was so intimidated that I really didn't have a lot of hope there. Uh, but uh, I still am, so anyway. Uh, so, but I went with my friend. And we went to the beach, and uh, every night it turned out that the cost of admission was you would go hear people preach and a lot of music and get challenged to give your life to Christ. And that uh, Thursday night, a man named Jay Kessler preached. At the time, I think he was president of Youth for Christ, later of Taylor University. And uh, uh, he preached, and he preached the good news, and he invited us to give our lives to Christ. And uh, it took me till 3 a.m. on the Ocean City Boardwalk to finally do that. Because you have to understand, my parents were not going to cheer when I came back with that news. Right, right, right. They were going to be pretty angry. As a matter of fact, for about 10 years, my mom kept saying, oh, you'll grow out of this stage. <laughs> still hasn't worked. I'm still here. But that's how they felt. I had to take a risk of a lot of my relationships in order to trust Christ. Not, I, I think often our faith becomes real yeah. when we take risks to embrace it. And uh, so I gave my life to Christ at that point. The next day, the group leader shoved a microphone in my hand and said, tell them what God has done for you. And I basically said, well, I don't really know what God has done for me. Like, I prayed something last night, but I couldn't explain to you what happened yet. Yeah. He said, you tell what God has done for you. He didn't let me get out of it. So I shared with the 200 people that he had gathered about what God had done for me very incoherently, very uh, inarticulately. Yeah. Uh, but I did my best. And then afterwards, he invited everybody who had accepted Christ that week to be baptized in the Atlantic Ocean. And 40 of us went down and were baptized in the Atlantic Ocean in, in uh, Ocean City, New Jersey. It was a time of renewal yeah, yeah. when people understood how good the good news was. Yeah. And I was excited. I went home. I, I felt like I got to share this. And I went home and I went up at about 10 at night to my two brothers. And I said, I've got great news. Jesus died for your sins. And by then, somebody taught me what I'd done. And uh, I, Jesus uh, died for your sins. And if you accept him as your Savior and Lord, uh, you know, you can be forgiven. You can be with God in heaven. You can have new life now. They were not tracking. They were not resonating. So at the end, I threw in a zinger. You guys don't want to go to hell, do you? <laughs> that was my smooth ability to share. Both of them prayed that night, but guess what? It had to be redone. I had not done it very well, but that's okay. Later on, they did redo it. 
and both of my brothers came into the kingdom. Later on, my father did. Wow. I'll talk about my mother right at the end. So I remember going to college then. I'd actually drifted some away from faith, but I got renewed. I remembered how good the good news was. I came back to Christ. And I remember talking to my friend, Scott uh, uh, Stringfellow, and I invited him into a little Bible study. We met for six weeks, uh, except we only got to the first week. Because on God as creator, he said, this is great, Rick, how do I do it? Well, by then I'd forgotten again. I couldn't tell him how to do it. I, I said, do what? He said, uh, you know, come to Christ or whatever. I said, well, I don't know, but I got this booklet. And I sent him home with a booklet. And he read it. And he called me the next day and he said, Rick, I did it. And I said, that's fantastic, Scott. What'd you do? And he taught me again the good news and how you invite somebody into that. I have been very excited at points in my life about the goodness and the newsiness of the good news. But I've drifted sometimes. I've kind of gone away from it. Why, why does that happen? You know, I think for me, uh, sometimes it's happened because I've heard it enough times that you've heard the saying, familiarity breeds contempt. Well, maybe not contempt, but at least maybe a little bit of apathy. All right. I think sometimes, too, I've moved on to the advanced issues of racial, racial justice and, and of other things that are gospel issues at the end of the day, because everything's a gospel issue. Yeah, yeah. But, but I got so focused on those things that I kind of forgot the core. I drifted away from it. At one point, I interviewed a student who'd been part of a, an urban project we'd done about six months later. I actually did that for my dissertation. And I, I asked how it was going, and he said, well, you know, I just found out last night at my large group meeting that Jesus forgives sin. This guy had been part of an urban project six months earlier for a whole week and had never heard that Jesus forgives sins. I, I realized I get off sometimes, so consumed by other issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, too, one of the challenges for people who grew up in a Christian home, like at least some of you did, is it takes a while for it to become yours. It takes a while for you to take the risks and embrace the truth and get excited about the good news that you've heard maybe since you were born. Yes, sir. So how do we recapture that? I want to suggest a, a, a couple of things. Uh, and I want to address an issue that I think is probably true for a lot of us. I think some of us struggle to feel like the gospel is good news because we're just not sure it's worked in our life in the way that we expected. We're just not sure it's as powerful as everybody up here says it is. Wow. We're just not sure that it actually has the power to change the world. Yes, sir. And I want to address that. So what's the gospel? It was read today, right? I passed on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, yes, sir. and that we, including the one who's writing Paul, know that happened because we actually saw it. We saw him. You know, Jesus is the center and the sum and the substance and the circumference of the gospel. Yes, and if we are recaptured by Jesus, we're always recaptured by the gospel. Amen. So Jesus died for sins, for self-centeredness, 
for self-will, for self-destructiveness, for both the wounds and the ways we've wounded others. Jesus died for sins, according to scriptures. And Jesus was raised for new life. Amen. He is the forerunner for all of us. What he has done in rising from the dead is a picture of what we will all do. That's what he makes so clear. And when we do, when we are raised at the last day, we shall know him mm -hmm. as he is because we shall be like him. Yes. Amen? Amen. Forgiveness of sins, new life, everlasting life, becoming like Jesus. You know, we do a whole class in our program on the gospel. We make it complicated. We break it down one way and this way, and we understand how it happened and all the theories and all the models and all of that stuff. But you know, the gospel is simple enough for a three-year-old or a six-year-old or an eight-year-old or someone struggling to get it. Yes, sir. Amen. And have their lives change. Yes. And sometimes we make it so complicated because we're trying to get over some of our apathy over the simplicity. But I tell you, once we lose the simplicity, we lose the power to preach it. Amen. We lose the power to communicate it. We lose the power to embrace it. Wow. And Paul just breaks it down. He makes it so simple. And it's simple for all of us, friends. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what I've done. Jesus' death has taken care of our sin. Amen. The wounds and the sins and the self-centeredness and the self-orientation and the ways we hurt people and our lusts and our imaginations and all of it. Yes, sir. That message should never get old because we need it every day. Yes. We need the gospel not just when we first come to Christ. We need the gospel every single day, sometimes every single minute. Yes. I'm focused on proclaiming the gospel or communicating the gospel or however you want to say that today. So I'm probably not, maybe not going to sin during the chapel message, but maybe a third or half of you will. That's what happens in church sometimes. We wander, we get lost, we have worries, we have concerns, unbelief in God, lust in our heart, all that stuff. Yes, sir. And we need the gospel. the gospel. Walking out of chapel. Yes, sir. I needed it yesterday, walking out of church. Yes, sir. Seeing an image that leads me to another image that brings lust in my heart. And I, I'm an old guy, I can't imagine. Why young people, with all that stuff going on, have to face every day and every moment. So do we need the gospel every day? We need the gospel because we live in a world that's not necessarily getting better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and unless we have some hope that it ever will, what are we living for? What do we have to look forward to? What do we base confidence on? And we have this hope that Jesus returns and makes all things new, including you and me Amen. in our communities. But we also have good news for now. Yeah. Because the gospel isn't just about life with God sometime in the by and by. It's actually about how Jesus, because of his forgiveness, can now be one with us. Yeah. As a mentor of mine once put it, another lives in you. Another lives in me. The most fundamental truth about the gospel in the here and now is you are in union with Christ. Everything that happened to Christ, everything he did, he did for you. You are in Christ. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. And that life of God is the most significant thing about us because it determines our identity and our ultimate destiny. Yes, sir. Here's, though, where I want to get into that issue. It doesn't always seem to work as well as we'd hoped it would. Can anybody give me a, an amen there? Amen. Are there times when we just feel like I keep facing the same thing? I keep having the same struggle. I keep losing my mind in this way or that way. 
I, I have that feeling. And I say, man, if the gospel is so transformational, why doesn't it do more in the here and now? I know some of you have that question. Yeah, yeah. I know you do. I know some of you don't have confidence in the gospel because you haven't seen the power of it in the here and now. Wow. And here's what I want to say back to me and to you. The good news is already, <laughs> and it's not yet. All of its power has not been fulfilled, but it is what will lead to that day when we shall rise with Christ and know him because we will be like him. At the same time, because Christ has died and we stand forgiven and cleansed and with the righteousness of Christ closing us, God can be one with us. Forgiveness means we can always wipe the slate clean, that's the gospel, and the resurrection and gift of the Holy Spirit means we can always have a fresh start. Amen. Always. It doesn't mean we'll always make the right choices. It doesn't mean we won't sometimes fall again. But we have the power, God's power. Yes, sir to make new choices, to go a new direction, to build a community that helps us get through. You know, the secret, sometimes you hear at Wheaton the word revival, and everybody seems to make it, oh, let's look for that mysterious, incredible time of revival. Revival is just the simple gospel in power, forgiving sin, and helping us make new choices. And, and it becomes so powerful that we're willing to face and admit who we are. I, we're willing to admit all the failures and all the gunk. Mm -hmm. I have it. I do. The despair sometimes. The doubts. My, you know, my, my mom passed away a couple years ago during COVID. And uh, she, she went from being an atheist to an agnostic in her lifetime. She grew up with a terrible church experience, but she liked what she saw in our lives after 10 years in, 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 a, in me and my brother's lives. So she moved. Well, praise God. But she, she passed away in the midst of COVID, isolated and alone. She and I had a final prayer together, but it wasn't a miracle bedside conversion. And I live with that. I want the gospel in our world to have all the power that I want it to have. Yes. <laughs> but I tell you, it has more power than anything else in the universe Amen. in our here and now, Amen. because it's God, since we have been forgiven, who's made union with us. Another lives in us. And that determines our identity and our destiny. The gospel's news because it's history. It's very surprising news. We can become a little bit numb to it, but it's very surprising news. It's history. A death and a resurrection that changed history. Events that still make our life possible today with forgiveness and new life and eternal life. It's history, and it's really, really good. And sometimes it doesn't do all the things we want it to because we're still in a fallen world, sinful people, struggling, facing death, and all of that stuff, I know. But it is the power of God for salvation. Yes, sir. It is the power of God for the transformation that is available to every one of us here. So I want to make a couple of challenges to end. I want to tell you a story. 
and hopefully make uh, hopefully the story will make you think a little bit. Uh, when I was six years old, my dad was in the military, and we were on a military base in North Carolina. And uh, I was six, and then I had two brothers, four and three. And uh, across the way were Uncle Joe and Auntie Claire. They weren't really uncle and auntie, but they were close friends of our family. And they uh, had three girls, six, Robin, four, Mike's age, and three, Christopher's age, my youngest, Al and Allison. And, at, and I, want, I do want to let you know, for transparency, is Annie Claire and my mom spent years trying to get at least one of us to marry one of them. <laughs> years! I am not kidding you. Uh, I don't think they helped. <laughs> Who knows what might have happened if they hadn't tried so hard, but it didn't work. But every Friday, we went out to the beach, and it was a blast, playing in the waves, being in the uh, ocean, uh, you know, building sand castles. And then Friday afternoon, every Friday afternoon, we'd pile back into the, a big, ugly green station wagon and make our way back to the military base. That was our Friday ritual. And uh, one Friday, we're driving back, and Allison, the youngest, three years old, says, where's Chris? And uh, Chris was a trickster, even at three, he still is. So we looked under the beach blankets, we looked in the wheel well, no Chris. We're 40 minutes away from the beach at this point. I go, hey mom, Chris isn't here. She thought I was kidding, so she went <laughs> like that. And then she realized I wasn't kidding, she went, <laughs> what? Like that. I, only that was a lot lower pitched than what she did. And at that moment, when she really believed the news that Chris wasn't there, we went on the rides of our lives and almost the ride that ended our lives. My mom grabbed the steering wheel and whipped it around and hit the accelerator and the, uh, and the brake simultaneously in traffic. A four-lane highway. We, I'm, I'm not kidding you, we did a wheelie on the two side uh, uh, station wagon wheels uh, while we're, uh, we actually bumped. And then she realized, oh, this is, traffic's coming at us, I better cross the median. So she crossed the median. She hit the accelerator at that point and she got that big, ugly green station wagon up over 100 miles per hour. I'm not kidding him. It's going, boo, 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 you know. 40 minutes took us 20 minutes. <laughs> we pull into the driveway, we all, I, the, you know, the parking lot, we all pile out, ran through the arches onto the beach, looking at every guard station I saw him first. There he was off in the distance. And I said, Mom, Mom, and then I go, Chris, Chris, and, and uh, you know, my mom turned and saw Chris. Chris had this big tear on his eye. I still remember it. I'm from six years old. And he turned and he saw my mom. They ran together. They started twirling. It was like a cheesy Hollywood ending. And, it was, and we were all like waterworks, right? Powerful moment. Just before we'd noticed Chris wasn't there, we were singing a song called Noah's Arky Arky. Um, I've tried this, not all cultures sing this song. Uh, how many of you know that? It's like 26 verses. Boy, it's, it's my generation, isn't it? <laughs> Noah's Arky Arky, and it's like 26 verses. We were on verse 21, we noticed Chris wasn't there, and thus began the ride of our lives. And I've thought since, my mother was at that moment a picture of God's passion for the people who ought to be here with us in the community who aren't. Wow. And she would have done anything, given anything, paid anything, and risked anything, including us, <laughs> to go get that person who ought to be here who wasn't. And I want to just end with this challenge. If you haven't refreshed or embraced the good news in your life, it's never too late. And if you need to embrace it again, 
and walk out of chapel confessing your self-centeredness and trusting Christ for forgiveness and committing to Christ as leader, go for it. But there's all these other people we love who ought to be in the station wagon who aren't in the community, but, and who aren't. You have them, high school friends, family members, extended family members, people in your life that you care about. I want you to know, more than anything else in the world, I want to see my mom yes, with Christ in heaven. And I pray, God, I did everything I could during my lifetime to communicate what I could. And I want to encourage you, as you're leaving chapel, to think about somebody see, you'll see at Thanksgiving, or somebody at another college, and you just think, I'm going to text them. I'm going to pray for them this month. I'm going to look for an opportunity to just talk about the struggles in my life and how God's made a difference. Not a cheesy story. A real story, raw. But that really does talk about how God's in your story. And look for curiosity. And look for a chance to let people in on the offer of forgiveness and new life and everlasting life. Amen.